Hi, everyone. Thank you for stopping by to watch another episode of Up Close with Mingo Mariano. On this episode, we're visiting with two-time Grammy Award winner, Rebecca Valadez. We'll be talking about her extensive music career that took her around the world with pop icon Janet Jackson. Also talking about her time with Selena the Musical, Grupo Mas, and the loss of her beloved mother, and so much more. So stay close, because you're watching Up Close with Mingo Mariano. Hi, this is Rebecca Valadez, and you're watching Up Close with Mingo Mariano. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, keyword Mingo Mariano, and find us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at Mingo Mariano. I was 17 years old. My mom took me out of school. We moved to Long Beach, California. I had a manager back then. And uh, and my whole job was to lose weight. Like I didn't think I was that big to begin with, but after you saw how much weight I lost, like I was a size zero. And um, that's when I got picked up to, well, when I auditioned for the Janet Tour was that, was that following year, because I was only 17 when I auditioned, but I was 18 when the tour started. Um, I didn't actually speak with Janet very often. I know that seems weird, but you know, Janet, she was the boss, and then she had her dancers. Her and her dancers were very close. And then I was in the band, and she had some like good friends in the band, but um, I didn't really converse with her to the point where like we were besties and we, we knew all of each other's secrets and stuff. Um, I regret that, but that's because I'm a scaredy cat, and now and she was intimidating. I mean, not that she is intimidating, but I was 18 and I've never, uh, my mom was like my own personal filter. <laughs> she would tell me when to be quiet and hey, maybe, maybe don't say that or Shh, you're acting crazy. Cause I, I have a threshold of cray cray and, <laughs> and I needed her to bring me back down. And since she wasn't there, um, I tried just to shut up and do my job. So I didn't really get to know her all that well, but one, when we did come to San Antonio, uh, she asked if I would handle all the press that day. And I was like, sure, that's like awesome, cool. I get to do interviews and stuff. Man, I saw the boss's job and I didn't want it after that day. I was up at six o'clock in the morning, radio interviews, television interviews. I didn't even get a chance to take a bath before uh, dress rehearsal started, or we, we do like a two hour so sound check. And uh, I didn't get to, barely had a chance to put my makeup on, like that's how long it went, from 6 a.m. to the show, to show time. Like, come on, really? Um, and that's what Janet does every day. I get mad when people call um, celebrities like elitist, Hollywood elite. Like, you don't have that job, you don't know how hard that job is. So the only reason you see them photographed on vacation is that's the only time they're not working they're always working like even before the tour even before I met her and started rehearsing for the actual tour she had already done a whole year's worth of the the pre-tour promo so she'd already been around the world the exact same tour that we were gonna go through and did small uh, TV spots with like a couple of dancers behind her and she'd already done a year's worth of work and she hadn't even actually started the tour yet you know, so I'm like, no, they're, they're not really elite. <laughs> they work hard and most of them have come from nothing and worked their way up to where they are now. So if anybody can complain about anything, it's that they know both sides. Yeah, they know what it's like to be poor and struggle and then they know what it's like to be the Hollywood elite. I don't know, I just get mad when people say that. I'm like, no. It's not an easy job, it's hard. It's the hardest job I've ever seen. That woman is a hard-working individual. In the year 2000, Rebecca embarked on a new project and auditioned for the Selena Forever musical. The singer went through an extensive audition process in New York and Miami and was ultimately casted as the official understudy of Selena. The musical premiered in San Antonio, Texas back in March of 2000 and went on a 30-city national tour. Rebecca talks about her experience and how she prepped for the role to play the understudy of Selena. They flew us to New York and then we flew to Miami, like the top 
five girls flew to Miami to do the final audition live on the Christina show. Yeah. And, uh, and then they said, I got the part. I was like, cool. Well, they, they split the part up between two ladies. And they tried to make me feel like I had gotten the lead, but really I was the secondary Selena, which I don't feel bad about. Um, I'm not the best actress in the world. I'm just going to put that out there for some people. Um, but it was, uh, that was interesting because there's so much pressure because you're in front of an audience. So you have to act in a setting that's, that doesn't feel natural, you know, because there's a huge crowd watching you. And there, uh, the, the thing I think that was weirdest for me is knowing that every single person in that audience had probably seen Selena perform live or knew of, you know, it's not like she had been gone so long that there's like a whole new generation that didn't know anything about her. No, they were all in the audience. <laughs> in 1995, at the age of 14, Rebecca was featured on the album Solo Para Ti by Grupo Mas. It was at that moment she was introduced to the bad boys of La Onda Tejana, most notably known for her intro and backup vocals on the chart-topping hit, Vuelve Conmigo. Rebecca talks about how she was introduced to the band and her time on the road with Joe Lopez and Jimmy Gonzalez. Rebecca toured with Maz from 1994 through 97 and later returned to join Jimmy after Joe and Jimmy departed ways. The singer also shares memories about Jimmy Gonzalez and where she was at the time she heard the news of his passing. I had a hairdresser. I don't know how we met this woman, but she was Miss Emily, talk of the town. Uh, and she did, yeah, <laughs> she did Joe and Jimmy's hair. Uh, she also was the one who fixed Stephanie Lynn's hair to make it look like Marilyn Monroe. She gave her the Marilyn Monroe look. I didn't realize how big they were uh, when I started playing with them. And then we started doing the shows and I was like, dang, there's a lot of people here, there's a lot of people here. Even though I had all those little solo bits, I was never really showcased. Um, I never had like a light on me, I basically was in the dark next to the, the drum kit or sometimes next to the percussion kit but you couldn't really see me very well from, from the audience. Did they introduce you? Yeah, did they introduce sometimes, you? yeah. Um, like Jimmy would try to and then Joe would. I, I cannot really remember a whole lot. from. I'm, again, I was 14, I'm 39 now. But uh, yeah, it was just weird. Weird, not a good place for kids on the road with the bad boys of La Onda. I mean, they, they're called that for a reason. I got hired in 94, and I left in 96, 97, somewhere around there, yeah. And then after they split up, um, Jimmy had called me. I was living in California. I was, my mom said that it would be beneficial to me to come back and sing for Jimmy again, which I said I didn't want to do, but I did it because my mom asked me to. And, uh, but we, we ended up winning a bunch of Grammys. So uh, it turned out to be a good decision. Those Grammys have opened so many doors for me, and I made sure that people knew that. that you know, J Jimmy, I didn't have any problems with Jimmy. Um, he was a nice guy. Of course, he had his family with him everywhere. He was a family-oriented kind of guy. Um, and he was very talkative and sweet and stuff. And um, yeah, I never had issues with Jimmy. He was just a nice guy. But I always, as soon as he died, I made sure that people knew most of the stuff that I've had in my life after that have been because of what, what Jimmy was able to accomplish. Who were you when you heard the news? I was at home uh, with my girls. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, it's funny you have kids and so you sort of don't want to cry in front of them which is hard for me to do because I cry at everything but I didn't really cry until later when I was I was looking through Facebook and somebody had posted a video of him um, like talking at the recording studio and I guess there's a difference between hearing somebody sing and then hearing somebody speak because when I heard him speaking then I, I broke down and I started crying. And then my daughter's like, why are you, why are you crying? I said, Cause that's, I said, that's my friend. And he died. And he was a good guy. Just coming into the studio and, uh, and record new, uh, new songs. And uh, eso es lo principal. No es que sea duro, pero es lo más bonito. Y sí se lleva bastante trabajo, pero uh, this is our life. We love this. 
producers aren't a dime a dozen, just like famous people aren't a dime a dozen. There's, there's some sort of footprint that you have to have in order to be huge like Jimmy was. And he had it. And regardless of how great the music sounded, it had that footprint in it. It had that DNA in it. Um, and that's why it was great. And, and I've, I've worked with some really great producers, but they don't have whatever that mysterious thing is. Yeah, it's something and you can't label it. There's no way to define it. You just have it or you don't. And Jimmy had it. I mean, Jimmy had lots of success on his own. And in the beginning, Jimmy was really insecure about it, I remember. Um, he's like, well, I didn't know if I was gonna sing. I didn't wanna sing it for me. I wanted to hire somebody to sing for me. And I heard the recordings, you know, I said, no, man, it sounds good. I said, you just do you. Don't worry about bringing somebody in. I mean, he did bring people in to sing the old stuff, but all the new stuff he recorded himself. Throughout this entire interview, it was quite evident that Rebecca's mother, Sandy, was a driving force behind Rebecca's career. In addition to carrying the titles of loving wife, mother, grandmother, and sister, she was also Rebecca's best friend. On February 5th, 2013, Rebecca lost her mother and best friend. She talks about that fateful day, how she had to deal with the loss of her mother two weeks after giving birth to her first child. Um, my mom was hilarious, for one. Uh, everybody loved her. I realized that after she was gone, uh, that all of my friends weren't actually my friends. They were all her friends. I just happened to know them, you know, and uh, uh, it was like trickle-down economics. It was like trickle-down friendship. <laughs> they were my friends because of her. But um, yeah, she lived sort of vicariously through me. And uh, I didn't necessarily like every decision that she made for my career, but you can't say that, that she was wrong because I've had so much success and all of it is because of the decision she made on my behalf. Um, and again, I wouldn't have the friends that I have today had my mom not been so outgoing. But no, I, I loved my mom. I, I'm not mad at her that she, that she died when she did. I'm a little... I can say that, that I lost everything when my mom died. My mom died two or three weeks after my first daughter was born. And then I lost my voice. So I lost my mom, I lost my voice, and I had this new baby that I should have been like super happy. Um, and people kept asking me if I had postpartum depression and I was like, dude, I have actual reasons to be depressed. This is, I have nothing to do with postpartum anything. I'm depressed because my mom died. My best friend is gone. So that's why I'm crying. I just need to, to mourn the death of my mom while taking care of this brand new baby that, you know, I've never been a mom before in my life. Like, who am I going to go to for advice now that she's gone? Before her mother passed, Rebecca talked about relocating back to San Antonio at the wishes of her father. At that time, she moved from L.A. to Texas to care for her mom while juggling a long-distance relationship with her now-husband, Darwin. Around that time, Rebecca discovered she was expecting her first child and, like most new moms, suffered from intense morning sickness. After spending several months caring for her mom, Sandy, Rebecca's father made the decision to retire from his job to spend more time with his wife. At that time, Rebecca relocated back to California from Texas to start a life with her then-boyfriend. The two were excited about starting a family and would later welcome a brand new baby girl to the family. Um, and my dad said, I need you to move home because my dad was in the, in the railroad at the time. He worked for Southern Pacific or Union Pacific. And he said, I don't want to be gone. And then come home to my wife, like on the floor or something, not knowing how many hours she's been there. Because my dad, with the railroad, you're gone for like a couple of days. Um, so he goes, I need you to come home. I can't do it by myself. I need you to come home. So I, I quit my job in California. I was dating my future husband at the time. Uh, and I said, we need to break up because I got to go home. And he said, no, we don't have to break up. Uh, I came home, I got a real job. I started working for IPAC. So I'd go to work for a few hours every day and then I'd come home and, and be with my mom. 
Um, and then my, my boyfriend and I decided we wanted to have babies because we didn't know how long my mom was going to be alive. But I knew I wanted a baby and I knew I wanted it with him. And he was cool with that. So then I got pregnant and, um, and my mom, you, know, you, you have all the symptoms of pregnancy, which is mostly puking and peeing a lot. But I would be throwing up every single morning. I would throw up. I threw up all through the entire pregnancy, not just the beginning, through the whole thing. So I'd wake up and do my morning puke. And my mom was in the wheelchair, and she couldn't fit the wheelchair into the bathroom. And I felt like all she wanted to do was like hold my hair and be a part of that experience, you know. And I said, "Don't worry about it. It's okay. You don't want to come in here and throwing up." She's like, "I know." She would cry, and uh, I was like, "Don't feel bad." Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, so when I left, I left because my my boyfriend had gotten an apartment for us in LA and he's like, this is where my job is and I want to be there when you have the baby. I don't want to fly out, you know, at some last minute emergency C-section or something. So I want you to come and live with me. So dad had retired early. I went it, I had an emergency C-section. And so my husband had to call them like in the middle of the night, said, Rebecca's, she's having the baby now. We weren't supposed to have it for another couple of weeks. We're having the baby now. And, and uh, so mom and dad woke up in the middle of the night, started packing their stuff, and they drove out the next day to California. It took them a while to get there, but then they were there, and of course my mom's still in a wheelchair. Um, and uh, she couldn't really hold the baby for very long once we brought the baby home. And I think she was upset because she couldn't like get in the kitchen and cook things for me, and I wasn't only taking care of the baby, but I had to take care of my mom too. When she drove away, like I didn't know that she was that that was the last time, but I cried so hard when she left that day. I had no idea she was. She died. Uh, they stopped in Flagstaff to take pictures in the snow, and my mom got out of the car. Uh, my dad walked her into the snow, and he said, "I forgot my camera. I'm gonna go back to the truck and get the camera. I'll be right back. Can you stay here?" She said, "Yeah." When he came back, mom had sat down in the snow, my dad took the picture, and then he walked her back to the car. And when he walked her back to the, the car, she, she muddled something, and he thinks that she said, I'm having a stroke. And then she collapsed, and the ambulance showed up, and dad you know, called 911, and she died in Flagstaff on the side of the road, you know, on her way home from meeting my first child. And that was like the worst day of my life. I found out my mom died on the side of the road somewhere by herself. And so then my dad had to drive home alone. We all offered to go be with him so that we could ride home with him. He said, no, I just need to drive home by myself. After touring with Janet Jackson and Supergrupo Mas, Rebecca released her own album in 2005, which garnered her an American Grammy nomination in 2006 for Best Tejano Album. The album included the hit song No Quiero Estar Sin Tu Amor, which did very well for the artist, but many may not know that the song was actually written in English by Rebecca and later transformed into the hit cumbia by none other than Jimmy Gonzalez. Jimmy had hired me to do like one concert with him somewhere, and I showed him this song that I wrote while I was at a songwriters uh, conference in uh, Toronto. I said, I wrote this song, it's called I Don't Want to Say Goodbye. And he heard the song, and Jimmy's got this gift for hearing like huge hits and like hearing them as cumbias. Yeah. Uh, he heard the song, and he's like, can I take this song? I'm gonna turn it into a cumbia. And I'm like, what, dude, this song ain't sound nothing like no cumbia. Like, I don't know what you're listening to. He's like, I'm gonna do it. Give me the song, and he took the song and completely transformed the song. And I heard it and I said, hey, that sounds pretty good. He goes, you want to record it? I said, okay. We went to the studio and recorded the song and I didn't really do anything with it. I didn't release it. I, uh, I gave it to one person to hear and that person leaked it onto the radio and that radio station sent the song everywhere. 
and then suddenly it was being played all over the United States and I had no idea. I was on the set of the Wayne Brady show when my mom called and she said your song is number one on the radio and I was like what song? She said that, that song, you know, the, the cumbia that you did with Jimmy and I looked it up and sure enough I, you see all the different charts No Quiero Estar Sento Amor was on top of the charts. I said, holy crap. She goes, you gotta come home and do an album. And I was like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> I don't wanna do this, no. I was making really good money doing something I really loved with a bunch of kick-ass celebrities that I'll never get another chance to see any of these people again. I mean, Barry Manilow. Today, Rebecca lives in San Antonio, Texas with her husband and three children. She is currently working on releasing an English album and is a mentor to several students at the Network for Young Artists, a nonprofit organization which promotes art and culture through voice and dance for the performing arts. On behalf of everyone at Up Close with Mingo Mariano, we'd like to thank you all for watching the latest episode and please like and share. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Keyword Mingo Mariano.